To many outsiders, culture in Los Angeles is something that begins and ends with the movies. But the city has always been home to radical voices and new ideas that have stirred things up in art, in literature, in architecture, and urban life. In recent years, the city's artistic profile has grown bigger and brighter with new cultural institutions, new approaches to art, and new ways of thinking about the landscape. Join me as we hit some of the city's most important cultural nerve centers. I'm Carolina Miranda, culture writer for the Los Angeles Times, and this is Artbound. Los Angeles is an infinitely inspiring city. It feels like you can just explore forever. Amazing people coming from all over the world with a craft. I am a maker, and as a maker, I'm a better designer. For me, the really exciting art happens at the boundary where the real gives up to the ideal. Next on Artbound. The opening of the Broad Museum has put a spotlight on LA's museum scene, but the city's institution building goes way back to one very determined man who helped spark the creation of LA's very first museum. Charles Lummis was a collector, explorer, and Indian rights activist who embodied all of the conflicting impulses that helped settle the American West. His crowning achievement, the Southwest Museum of the American Indian. So this here is a tray that uh, appears to probably have been built by Lummis himself. Not 100% sure, but uh, the interesting uh, part of this is the brand right here. He branded it with his name, which was very typical. He branded most of his woodwork with his name. But then above that, he branded this particular piece with, with these fists, which is kind of uh, indicative of the, the way he did everything in life but definitely the way he was very proud of the woodwork he did in this house and the construction of the house. And I think that was a good way, his way of sort of describing that, that uh, feeling. So he's known for his advocacy for Native Americans. He's known for his, his writings. He's known for, uh, as a photographer, we get people who are interested in early photography to come, who come here. We have people who are interested in architecture. He was all of these things. People come in here and they say, well, who is Charles Lummis? I say, okay. I'll give it to you as quickly as possible, but you might want to have a seat. We rarely see someone in the landscape in the 19th century in Southern California with that kind of charisma. Now, he knew it. He's described as this ultimate Southwesterner, charismatic, colorful. He was a showman. He was eccentric. I think he was manic. He was a storyteller. He was an archivist. His appetite for both experience and learning seems to be bottomless. His ambition, his exuberance, his physicality, his creativity, his work ethic, he's just wired for energy and he does a lot in his lifetime. He was an explorer, a photographer, archaeologist, a writer, and founder of the Southwest Museum, among other things. A great writer, um, a good writer. He was quite possibly Los Angeles' first multiculturalist, or certainly its most vivid, vocal, and active multiculturalist. I don't mind so much if people say Loomis, but if you want to be really correct, it's Lummis. 
Charlie was born in Lynn, Massachusetts in 1859, uh, March 1st. His father was a principal of a school and then later a professor at a university. His mother died when he was around two. He was actually brought up by his relatives. His father couldn't take care of two little children, so he was brought up by extended family. He said he couldn't learn in a school setting. And he tells his father, I can't learn this way. Can you please teach me? That's a very astute uh, self-perception for a child to have. I had no violent personal ambition for college. I went because father had gone, because he had trained me with years of personal concentration, and because it was the cultural convention of New England, to which I acceded, as I did with most things, up until Harvard. I think he uh, appreciated the experiences related to the social aspects of college. The things outside of the classroom is what really piqued his interest. He built himself up athletically in Harvard. He was going to do things throughout his life with the power of will and force of his personality was going to just discover who he was meant to be, figure out who am I really and where am I really supposed to be in the world, and then become that. Then he flunked out of Harvard, huh, because it uh, had something to do with trigonometry, not his gift. Not my gift either, by the way, when I was in school. He had plans to visit Europe on foot, you know, backpack through what I guess a lot of people did. But unfortunately, his finances uh, were not such that he could do that. So um, instead, uh, he had moved to Ohio and was working there and feeling very confined by the whole experience. He was not really cut out for life on the farm in a small town. He had gotten into working with the newspaper in Chillicothe. At that time, the news business was uh, very diverse. There were multiple outlets uh, in the press. It wasn't like today as concentrated. I think it was an acquaintance that brought his attention to the Los Angeles Daily Times. He was impressed with the stories. It started with a correspondence between him and Colonel Otis. He actually asked Harrison Gray Otis, who was the editor and publisher of the Los Angeles Daily Times at the time, for a job. There was one letter that I came across from Harrison um, describing that Lemus had a lot of pluck and he really admired that in him. So he wanted him to come to Los Angeles straight away. I don't know. Who was the first one to suggest, why don't you walk? Instead of jumping on a train, why don't you come by foot? He, on his own, came up with this idea of walking across the country. So when he reached out to Otis at the Times, it was just another means of securing an income from his trip. When Charles Fletcher Lummis sets his sights on Los Angeles, he's not alone. That place is starting to reach national and international attention. It's slow at first, but it generates a great deal of excitement, certainly through the latter 10, 20 years of the 19th century. The West is calling to him as it called to many people, the idea of a new world, a different life, unlimited opportunities, adventure, and the idea that if you have an adventure, it could be a rite of passage. But why a tramp? That's what a great many of my friends said when they learned of my determination to travel from Ohio to California on foot. I was after neither time nor money, but life. Life in a truer, broader, sweeter sense. The exhilarant joy of living outside the sorry fences of society. I'm an American and felt ashamed to know so little of my own country as I did, and as most Americans do. My sense of him is that one of the driving forces of his life, one of the driving ambitions of his life, was to educate the rest of the country about who's really in this country, 
Who are we really? Who is this mix of people we call Americans? One of the advantages of walking is that you experience the place in a very direct and physical way. You experience the air, the temperature. You sleep on the ground. You know what the place is all about because you're immersed in it for months on end. Slowly, as he walked from Ohio to Los Angeles, he became physically absorbed in the West. He knew what the air felt like. He knew what the dirt felt like as he walked through it. So there was an experience of the landscape, which he responded to in a way that really shaped his future, I believe. The notion that he's walking across the continent is a bundle of intellectual curiosity. Certainly the corners and byways of the American Southwest are not particularly well understood by people like Lummis, so he probably wanted to get on the ground and see it. He's also self-promoting because when he can do that walk and advertise himself as someone that's doing it, that's attention grabbing, that's newsworthy. He used his dispatches to the Chillicothe leader as a way to fund his trip. This is where he started to become a celebrity. People would follow his stories weekly. He's writing these little columns that are being syndicated across the country. And what happens when you have to turn out a column a week? You better have had an adventure. And if you haven't had an adventure, you damn well better come up with one anyway. I'd been walking a good deal for years before starting on the tramp, but the ground was burned up with drought, and the weather was still very hot. Walking all day, day after day on that baking surface soon made my feet sore as one huge boil. The weather was hardly best for walking. It was oppressively and hot. And I had several days of trudging and pouring rain. A huge and savage dog leaped in pursuit of me. With the instinct of a boxer, desperate uppercut with my hunting knife, blade caught him squarely under the he throat. never made a sound, except a dying gurgle. He would uh, embellish things in good Western fashion. Like any journalist, he was uh, interested in engaging the audience. So when you look at his letters, you have to be uh, taking them with a grain of salt about his, uh, the veracity of every detail. If you look at him solely through a kind of class portrayal, he's a white guy of the later 19th century who went to Harvard. That kind of predisposes him, perhaps, to have particular views of his class, his generation, his gender, etc. Two miles out from Little Cacharis and on the willowy banks of Cacharis Creek, I ran across a big plaza of Mexicans. In it, in lousy laziness, exists 200 Mexicans of all sexes, ages, and sizes, but all equally dirty. They are a snide-looking set, twice as dark as an Indian, with heavy lips and noses, and a general expression of ineffable laziness. So he starts out with these perceptions of the people that he's going to meet along the way. And as he continues his journey, goes farther and farther out, and finally reaches the West and begins to meet the people, he's struck again and again how they don't fit his perception. In Colorado, the Mexicans are very much in the minority. They are a simple, kindly people ignorant of books, but better taught than our own average in all social virtues, in hospitality, courtesy, and respect for age. It would be a thorn to our conceit if we could realize how many very important lessons we can learn from them. It filled me with astonishment to find Indians who dwelt in excellent houses, with comfortable furniture and clean beds and clothing and food, Indians who are as industrious as any class in the country, and tilled pretty farms and had churches of their own building, and who learned none of these things from us. I speak now from years of intimate but honorable personal acquaintance with them, an acquaintance which has shamed me out of my silly prejudices against them, which I shared with the average Saxon. I don't think we can say that, that he was completely uh, cleansed of uh, cultural or racial prejudice or chauvinism, but I will say that, that he developed um, intimate knowledge and, and, in some cases, friendships. What he found uh, was a series of personal relationships. He uh, developed friendships which lasted his lifetime, and that's really where you start to get 
the transformation uh, at an honest level, where he formed friendships with the Chavez family, a very prominent multi-generational family of New Mexico. And they, with incredible hospitality, welcomed him into their home. They basically treated him like a king. They gave him a place to sleep. They fed him really good food. And they just opened their doors to him. And they developed that relationship throughout Lamas' life. A decades-long, deep friendship. February 1st, 1885, a 30-mile walk through beautiful towns past the picturesque old mission of San Gabriel brought me at midnight to my unknown home in the City of Angels. When I pulled off my shoes from tired feet that night, I had walked since leaving Cincinnati in my roundabout course a fraction of over 3,507 miles. I had been out 143 days and had crossed eight states and territories. The longest and happiest tramp ever made for pure pleasure was over. At 9 o'clock next morning, I was in the harness, the city editor of the Los Angeles Daily Times. It may be an open question whether or not he walked the whole thing, because sometimes, if I'm not mistaken, he seems to get somewhere quicker than he could have done even if he'd been running. One of the ways you make sense of a new region, or one of the ways you smooth and rationalize transitions in regime, which is the Los Angeles that Lummis entered in the 1880s, is you write about it. You put words into the newspapers, and you write about transitions, and Lummis was part of that. In the last three years, the population has doubled, going from 15,000 to over 30,000. In the last two years, 3,000 new buildings have been erected in Los Angeles. Come out here, where you can and will live out of doors the year round. You will find health, happiness, and a livelihood here. And two or three years from now, look me in the eye and say, Lum, that advice has been the making of us. It opened us to the best and happiest periods of our lives. God bless you, and hoorah for Southern California. Charlie arrives uh, right at the ignition of the boom in real estate development in Southern California, brought on by the connections of the railroad and the competition between the two railroads coming into Southern California. There is a land rush going on, and in the process, an effort to create something to market. This is an advertising effort to find an identity. Los Angeles projects this idea of rose-covered, semi-tropical paradise. Something to keep in mind when you think about his so-called boosterism of Los Angeles, he was a true believer. Some people pitched this idea of Los Angeles so that they could sell land. He didn't have anything to sell. He just believed that this was a place where exciting and important things could happen in a rich and fertile landscape. Fertile in the sense of the growing things in nature, but also artistically and creatively fertile. Los Angeles is one of the most unique of cities. It is not a commercial emporium. It's a great colony of prosperous and cultured seekers for a place of residence where the conditions of life shall be most favorable. In fine, people who are not content to live just anywhere so that they do exist, but demand to live in the Garden of Eden. One way to encapsulate what's going on in LA in the generation after the Mexican War is through a whole series of adjectives. Exuberant, enthusiastic, zealous, boosterish. And so dealing with the regime change of a place that was once quite recently Mexican, and then rapidly Americanizing in terms of tourists, migrants, settlers, forms of government, forms of private property and adjudication of private property. There is a kind of exuberance about that period. Exuberance isn't all good. Uh, exuberance can also be ugly and it can be racially antagonistic. There's some great tensions on that landscape as well and Lummis would have seen that and in fact he would write about it. The blood of the old Los Angeles was slow and sluggish. Its pulses had never felt the thrill of the age. It walked in beaten paths. Stability and not change was the law of its life. 
Its old adobe walls might be regarded as the photographs of the lives behind them. They were changeless. But all this has passed. Bright, lovely, modern Los Angeles was born, cradled in the fragrance of the orange and rejoicing in the sunshine of the semi-tropical climate. As she grew, she overturned the old order of things. The blood ran quick in her veins. It was not blood native to the soil, but it was the warm, stirring blood of American progress. In the 1850s, the Mexican descent and mestizo population is maybe 75% of the population. By the 1880s, it's the white population, the latter 1880s, that has gotten that demographic authority. By the time Lemus arrives in Southern California, the Anglo ascendancy is assured. So with that becomes the romanticization of what came before. And that's a fairly sharp turn in the culture. What had been seen as perhaps antagonistic, people of indigenous background, indigenous culture, the indigenous history, had somehow gotten exotic and even quaint because the transitions of power had taken place. And so what we get out of that is a cultural alchemy that we've called the Spanish fantasy past. The adoption of the Spanish fantasy past was for many of the elite uh, within the business community a way to give it Los Angeles a, a, a um, appealing persona. There was this need to create this kind of mythology of Southern California in order to sell real estate. And Lummis was pretty comfortable with uh, promoting that kind of image. He does, to a certain extent, reinvent himself and become whatever we can define a Southwesterner is. And I would define it as a man like Lummis, an Anglo-Saxon man who comes West and actually finds new cultures, new environments, and finds meaning and potentials for other Anglo-Saxons to come and settle and start a new life. To me, this is no small matter. I'm not a Southwesterner because I have to be, but because I choose it. I count it the most important venture our Saxon tribe has ever made. I believe that in this motherly climate, the race now foremost in the world will fairly outstep itself in achievement, and most of all, the joy of life. At certain moments, Lummis looks and sounds like a 19th century racist. He views the Southern and Eastern European immigration streams as degrading to the American population and degrading to the American national fabric. But at the same time, his interest in indigenous peoples of the American Southwest is driven by profound humanitarian beliefs, friendships, and a certain kind of scholarly acuity that separates him from the vast majority of people in his era. But he contradicts himself. Here in our midst, we have the native Californian, generous in his nature, moderate in his impulses, and content with what he possesses. The march of progress he does not heed, the improvements of the age he does not imitate. He tends the old groves and is content with his adobe walls and tiled roofs. He looks askant at the new life about him. He is in it, but not of it. He'd been sleeping four hours a night, working around the clock for the LA Times when there was no overtime and there was also no workman's compensation. So he gave himself a sort of physical breakdown with his workaholicism. Workaholicism, I guess that could be a word. He uh, gets there in the crack of dawn, 5 a.m., if not earlier, and stays late. He barely sees his wife and I think it took a toll on him. If you're working 20 hours around the clock and you're working feverishly, yeah, you'll break down after a while. Your body's not supposed to go with that little sleep. He felt he didn't need more than four hours sleep. In those days, they didn't have the kind of medical analysis that we do now. I don't know that he was ever properly diagnosed, so I can't speculate about what happened to him physically. His body just snapped.
from the stroke, he was paralyzed on the left side. He had a paralysis and a weakness in his left hand and also probably in his left leg. The LA Times kept him on the payroll for about two months and then just dropped him from the payroll. And I think that was the end of his career at the Los Angeles Times. He took a leave of absence to go to New Mexico to recuperate. The Shavs is actually told Lummis's wife or requested Lummis's wife to put Lummis on a train and send him to us and he'll recuperate here. So he ended up um, then going and spending time at the Chavez's ranch. He did a lot of the physical feats to try to overcome <laughs> the paralysis that he had. He just pushed and forced himself to do things that a paralyzed person should not be able to do. He still hunted. I think one of the things he learned how to do with one hand is roll a cigarette. If anybody thinks you can roll a cigarette with one hand, I challenge them to try that. But he taught himself to roll a cigarette in one hand. So in this picture, you see him. One arm is hanging at his side because it's useless, and he's rolling his own cigarette. took an interest in politics and got involved with some issues with a range war. He then moved to Isleta Pueblo and he had to talk his way in to be able to stay there. Yeah, it probably forced his way in. <laughs> People of European descent usually did not go and live two years in a Native American community and live the same way as the people in the Native American community lived. And that was very, very important to his intellectual and emotional development. He paints his picture uh, of sort of becoming this white Indian um, is, I'm pretty sure, not how the community saw him. They saw him as this eccentric outsider, but they liked him. I mean, he was, uh, he was uh, an interesting character. In a whole variety of Native cultures, he was particularly drawn uh, to the Pueblo uh, communities because to him it was more like an Anglo culture. You know, I mean, his prejudice, part of it is the kind of Native communities he responded to were those he could understand. Living in more settled communities, uh, less nomadic, more agricultural, the, the artistic creations were more in tune with the artistic creations that he was used to. So it, it felt more familiar, even though it felt exotic. So he, he resonated with the Pueblo communities. It pleases me to remember how that my first introduction to Pueblo Indians impressed me. For now, I have lived for four years among them, and they seem like lifelong friends. I made in this time many thousands of five by eight plates. Of that host of pictures made at that time, there are very many that are unique and can never be made again, of types that are dead, buildings that are destroyed, ceremonials that are no more. I think he felt that the kind of cultural sentiment the cultural view of the world that he found in Native American culture was something that would be a, a great benefit to the larger American society that he felt needed to have a better sense of its past. I think he really believed that, and it, it's reflected in his work.
and they probably wouldn't let him just stay in his letter. And I think by that time, he'd also had an audience in Los Angeles, because that was the only way he could ever make money was to sell articles, whether it was to magazines or, or newspapers. As a writer, he needed a job. And so many artists have gone through this experience of the push and pull of economic necessity. About 1895 is when he agreed to take over the editorship of The Land of Sunshine, rather than just trying to sell his magazine articles, because he was not an independently wealthy person. At that time, The Land of Sunshine's main focus was as a booster magazine for the Chamber of Commerce. So he was supposed to be writing articles to attract people to come to L.A. Lummis was reluctant to take on the job precisely for that reason, and he uh, recognized the role of the mouthpiece of the Chamber of Commerce as a very uncomfortable role for him to fill. And so what he did was to do the booster rhetoric, but also to slip in a lot of really rather radical arguments. It became much more political. He used it as an expression of his political beliefs. And he called his column the lion's den. It is a strange spectacle to see the Congress of the United States cowering before a few noisy speculators and afraid to pass legislation urged by the president. In the matter of a harbor for Southern California, the wholesale damning of Mr. Huntington has been a little silly and a little cowardly. The whole congressional course of the Cuban reciprocity business has been a pitiful example of indecision and forgetfulness of principle. Southern California is the only portion of the United States which is doing active incorporated work for the preservation of historic landmarks. No other sector outside the Southwest has such magnificent relics to preserve, or so many of them. He uh, gave editorial space to people who wanted to limit development, wanted to preserve watersheds, wanted to protect indigenous communities, wanted to celebrate elements of Southern California which his employers, um, of course, uh, were interested in transforming. He was in opposition to what was beginning to go on in Los Angeles and would pick up speed pretty soon, which was a rejection of the past. Of course, Los Angeles is the city of the future. During the year which ended November 30th, 1896, Los Angeles, a city of a little over 100,000 in population, erected 2,312 buildings, an average of six and one-third new ones every day of the year. 65% of them were dwellings. This sort of thing has been keeping up for years. What does it mean? In the latter 20 years or so of the 19th century, because of the geologic feature of the Arroyo Seco, which is a long and sometimes cavernous canyon, rolls along a tributary of the Los Angeles River coming out of the San Gabriel Mountains, there arises an attraction, a cultural attraction to that landscape amongst a fairly bohemian crowd. And Lummis is certainly one of them, if not the leader. And that fairly bohemian artsy crowd are living close to nature and producing some of the most interesting artistic creations of Southern California's culture in a period from roughly 1885 to 1915. man's home should be part of himself. Something of the owner's individuality should inform it. Everyone knows that the thing he has made is more genuinely his than the thing he has bought. The creative thrill is so fine and keen. It is pitiful for a man to get a home off of the bargain counter and miss all the joy he might just as well have had in building it. 
he purchased these lots in 1895, started building the house in 1897. He purchased this lot because of its natural beauty, so its location, the surrounding area, and being on the banks of the Arroyo Seco right here. And once he purchased this lot, it occurred to him that he can use the stones from the Arroyo, which is right along the edge of the property, to actually construct the house. And that's what this house is made of. It's made of mostly stone, which came from the edge of the property right here. The creativity of his mind is on display there. And also, at the same time, something that resists convention, it has a powerful beauty and its own synthesis, and it's representative of a mind and a life. He more or less built this house single-handedly over about 12, 13 year period. He did have help. Some parts of this house, you could see there's no way one human being could possibly do that. But otherwise, yeah, it was more or less toiling away every day for about a dozen years or so. People were really coming out to this area, the Arroyo Seco. Artists, artist communes, this type of vibe going on here. This area has always attracted artists, it still does, but that was sort of the very beginnings of it. He began inviting the cowboy poets, the Western artists, the Western writers, the great opera singers, anybody who did anything interesting at all. If you did just one interesting thing, you were invited to Charlie Lummis's house. And his house becomes a salon, which he didn't say salon, he said noises. Salon, that's East Coast, he had noises. The noises were you know, the infamous parties that Lummis had here and attracted all kinds of people. We have Lummis's original guest book, and so thankfully we know the who's who and when they were here and on what occasion. This is a copy of Lummis's original guest book. The original guest book is at the Braun Research Library at the Southwest Museum, which is part of the Autry. There's famous names in here you'll recognize, John Muir, Will Rogers, people we know that for, have known for years were visitors here. But then there's other people who are not as well known today, but people who had fascinating contributions to the history of uh, particularly the West and the United States that we know were visitors here. And it really kind of emphasized how uh, influential this place is really on a national scale just because of the types of conversations that were had here. was a force behind it, creating a gathering spot where interesting people who might never have met each other would come together and there'd be this exchange of influences, right? Sort of a cross-pollination. You know, this Arroyo set, this sort of uh, intellectual culture of writers and poets, printers, architects, it's really interesting that they're all pretty much like him. They were wasps from the East and were very much in the same cultural mode as, as he was. By day, he may have been deeply immersed in local culture and understanding and passionate about it, but maybe in another light, he was very much an exclusive social animal. That's what makes him an interesting and complicated person. The land of sunshine would very much like to see founded a Southern California museum. Such an institution would naturally, of course, be located in Los Angeles, the chief city of these 45,000 square miles. And the bulk of the preliminary labor is already done. We have here private collections which, in their one specialty, surpass that department of any great museum, and enough of them to give us such a museum as now exists in no city of this size in the world. Lummis's awareness and, and uh, passion about the past leads him in a straight line to the prime mover role in creating the first museum in Southern California, in Los Angeles. He got behind this movement to establish what began as just a, a society for preservation, but moved into creating an actual physical museum. In 1907, the Southwest Society was born as a way to uh, collect the physical artifacts of 
what everybody recognized was a rapidly changing society here in Los Angeles. He didn't come from means himself, but he was really good at, at lobbying forces and joining people together and creating um, support and, and developing funds for his causes, one being the building of the Southwest Museum. We can hardly hope to rival the all-embracing museums of a great metropolis but we can very easily have the largest and best museum of a locality that was ever opened, distinctively Southern California, covering accurately and fully the infinite range of scientific and aesthetic interests peculiar to the seven counties. In terms of the collecting agenda, he was not focused exclusively on uh, any particular culture. He wanted to really uh, combine the cultures. So it was very uh, forward-looking, you could say, uh, while it was uh, also very much aimed at preserving things that he saw as going away. He believed that the people who were here before and people who had a long history here and were living with us concurrently had built something of great value, and we'd better pay attention to it. It would be a collection so endlessly valuable and ceaselessly fascinating that it would be famous the world over. The early 20th century, we have the building of the Los Angeles Aqueduct the opening of the Southwest Museum and Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County as important institutions that signal Los Angeles coming of age. Lummis felt that preserving Native American cultures and Mexican cultures was very much important for Los Angeles as it was moving into the industrial age. So I think it was important to continue his work in preservation by building a structure to house his collections. The collections attached to the Southwest Museum are extraordinary. And so the cultural power of those collections and the opportunities to teach people about indigenous cultures and indigenous craft and artwork, about that complicated history of very, very diverse peoples on the Southwestern landscape, that's an important place in Southern California's cultural DNA for a century now. Every museum has this conflict of being a place where things are presumed to no longer be alive. This is where you put the old stuff. In indigenous communities, things that have spiritual value uh, remain alive and need to be respected and need to be kept within the community. So there's been and continues to be a lot of conflict about how indigenous culture is presented within the museum context. I think that if you were going to make a critique, it's that he didn't fully recognize uh, the agency within Native communities to determine their own future. We already know that he was a man who could never break away from his own cultural baggage, his own chauvinism, his own Eastern intellectual view of the world. But for his time, Lummis was as good as it would get in terms of a preservationist. And he did amass a lot of raw data that is now available for um, much more careful uh, observation and, and reflection. For almost 40 years, I've been a collector. The Southwest Museum will not take everything. Its duty to its community measures up with its duty to science. But what it accepts, it will care for and trust, so long as the fabrics will hold together or the pages stand. What they can provide as an index of history and of human life will be preserved. Lummis was a preserver with every fiber of his being. He wanted to protect and to present the beautiful things that had been made uh, here and uh, throughout the Southwest. That was what his life was about. So the Southwest Museum was just an extension of his life. You are in the Brown Research Library, which houses the Southwest Museum institutional archives, as well as Charles Fletcher Lummis manuscripts, photographs, sound recordings, and other things created by Charles Lummis. 
We have a little over 1,300 linear feet of manuscript materials all together. Lummis takes up about 160 linear feet, 269 boxes, and it includes his letters that he wrote to people, as well as the letters he received, of course, his journals, his scrapbooks that he created, camera equipment, notebooks, a lot of different pieces because he was involved with so many different things. Just want to go to that page. Usually it starts with where he is, what time he got up, and um, the weather. So the weather was perfect on June 14th, 1904. Perfect, perfect hot. And this is the day that he should have done the recording. These are the wax cylinder recordings made by Charles Fletcher Lummis. Before 1904, around that time, he had asked for money to do these field recordings from the American Institute of Archaeology. And his argument was that we need to record these Spanish folk songs now, which was about 1902, 1903, or else um, those that would be able to sing these songs would no longer be around in 10 years' time. So he called it Capturing Archaeology Alive. And with the genius of Thomas Edison's technology of wax cylinder recording, and player that he can now actually record these songs and save them until perpetuity. Uh, so there's about 600 wax cylinder songs. Most of them are Spanish language songs. He recorded songs at his home in El Alisal and we've been re-recording the songs in the new playback medium since the 80s and now they're in digital form. They are probably the earliest recordings of, of Mexican songs that were recorded here in this region. Lummis was a man that was productive and he was proud. And for him to have this record of what he did, it helped him take stock of what he accomplished. And therefore that's where he found the value or what he um, contributed to whatever may be while he was around. Lummis is looked at, when he's looked at at all, as one of the chief boosters of Southern California from the latter 19th century forward, and that's true. His role with Land of Sunshine is profound. His role with the Los Angeles Times is important. His role as a cultural mediator, his role as a party giver, these are very important booster moments for the guy. And he's in some respects a one-man band for advertising Southern California as a place to be considered and thought about. Where we forget about Lummis and his role in this is that Lummis is terribly interested in, in a sense, keeping Southern California in the Southwest. Having walked it, and having written a lot about it, and having spent a lot of time in New Mexico, Lummis is a student and a creature in the latter half of his life of the American Southwest. And he views Southern California as part of that. Certainly, geographically, and even topographically, it is. But as the metropolitan ethos and impulses of the early 20th century begin to take off, in essence, Southern California leaves the Southwest. It becomes a metropolitan city with different ambitions. And for Lummis, that's a loss. There's a lot of concern uh, around the beginning of the 20th century. What was going to define America moving forward? And for many people, it was an embrace of modernism. We're going to celebrate technology, celebrate this vital urban industrial America. For a lot of other people, though, there was concern that some sense of the American heart would be lost, that there was no soul in modernity. Hollywood comes in, and it's the glamorous 20s, the, the capital of modernism. Charlie was a, an advocate for the past, of, of preserving things, of holding on to things that were important and beautiful that were being lost. In 
Los Angeles, which is really justly known as a city that destroys the past, that uh, obliterates its own memory and its own physical environment. Here was somebody who stood up for preserving memory, for preserving the physical environment, the cultural landscape, and a sense of identity rooted in place, instead of the sort of abstract push into utopia. different vision for the city, which still resonates. And in fact, I think it's interestingly growing in the city. An appreciation for the rootedness of Los Angeles in a particular landscape, to see it as part of an arid landscape, part of the Southwest, to see it as a community of multicultural ferment I think we can spend a lot of time talking about his faults and, and who he was in his time. But the fact is today, we have collections, we have narratives that he amassed, that he preserved, and they're very useful. And we should appreciate that and use them for deeper understanding of our past. In many cases, that's, that's all we have. Cabeza Nicolás 